So let me just start by saying I am in no way good or specifically knowledgeable in the things that we're talking about. I'm struggling. I'm struggling with these things. But as I'm on this journey, the same as we're all on the journey, the things that I am struggling with, I'm sure you guys are struggling with too. Such is common to man, right? That's, that's the, the same temptations that always have been, always will be, all the way back to the beginning and up till right now. So I'm a, I approach this with the utmost in humility and understanding that I'm not good at this. Some of the things that I'm going to be talking about are a little bit heavy, but there is light at the end of the tunnel, right? We are talking about the delight series, right? We're, we're delighting in God and what that looks like and how we do those things. But sometimes there's a gap there. And that gap is defined by what does delighting in God look like? I mean, use the, the, the Mr. Miyagi theory there, right? I mean, go back to Daniel San and he's trimming the bonsai tree. He said, well, how do you make it look like that? Close your eyes, picture tree. Okay, open your eyes, make this look like picture in your mind. There's a gap there between what actually is and what the idea is. So delighting in God, it's the idea. Close your eyes, what does delighting in God look like? What does whatever we're doing look like? Does that look like delighting in God? The gap is a little difficult to understand. It, in, in engineering terms, you know, I'm an engineer, anybody didn't know that, um, we call it a situation appraisal. You go and look at what you have, compare that to the goal, and then we can put a plan on how to get from here to there. So analyzing that gap a little bit, going deeper and to understand it, we have to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. In that garden, Adam and Eve allowed themselves to be deceived, and they started listening to the lies of the enemy. They started hearing, you're not good enough. You don't have everything that God has. He started appealing to their insecurity, their desire for more, that we all have those same things, right? So he's, he's appealing to those things and creating a, a lie. And he says, here, if you do this thing, then you'll be like God. You'll have everything you need. It's a lie. It's scarcity. Not the, the truth of God's word, which is abundance. It just says, here's all the things that you need. Over here, it's, you don't have all that you need. So what, what are we listening to? Adam and Eve listened to, I don't have everything I need. Here's how I get the thing. And then they screwed it all up for all of humanity and all of mankind forever. Great. Awesome. So there's a gap. The gap is we have a God-shaped hole in our body now because we're separated from him. We were designed for an intimate relationship with God. Do you know that his name is written in our DNA? I mean, we, we can go look, talk about that at a different time, but the, the scientists that are searching out truth, that are looking at DNA, they've seen this pattern, this repeating pattern, that's God's signature on our DNA. Our very breath, when you breathe in, you're just sitting there quiet and you can hear yourself breathe. Those are the, the, the words, the letters, Yahweh. Our breath speaks his name. We're, we're meant to praise him. We just got done singing the song, forgive me, I don't remember the name of it, the same God, right? Same God that always was. And then, great are you, Lord, where the, the words in there talk about our voices crying out to him, our bones singing to him. We, we are meant to have that connection, but because of sin gap, we can't do that. There's this brokenness there. There's, there's this separateness 
where we're intended to be one with God, this oneness, this being part of, connected to each other and to God through that. We're his creation, but it's broken. So now that there's a hole there, we try to fill up that hole. What do we fill it with? Drugs, alcohol, those are some negative ones, right? Well, what about positive ones? What about activities, going and doing stuff? What about buying things? Anybody have a love-hate relationship with Amazon? Um, so getting the things, right? Oh, I got something new. I got something shiny. It's hope. There's a little bit of satisfaction there. The drugs and the alcohol numb the pain. What is pain? Pain is our body's normal built-in response to, it, it's our alarm system, right, that says there's something wrong. You need to heal. You need restoration. Anybody ever broken an arm or had to go through surgery or get hurt in some way? I mean, I'm sure it's common, right? That's something that happens to all of us. And we feel the pain. And the pain says, hey, don't step on that. That hurts. We need to heal. We take the weight off of it, the broken leg, the, the knee surgery, the whatever. We have to heal from those things. You have to take time and heal. So if we're not healing from them, we're just numbing that pain or trying to fill it up with feel-good stuff like going to work. It doesn't necessarily feel good, but it makes us forget about the, the pain, the, the gap that's there. I was listening to a podcast. Uh, guy's name was John Gordon. And John was talking about how... Um, and he was talking with, with one of these guys that said that he's a businessman and he just was absolutely addicted to success. He would go to work every day and he'd build a company and then he'd build another company and he'd build another company because every time he stopped engaging and building these companies, he just felt like a failure. He started getting these, this self-doubt, this fear that he wasn't good enough. Even though he can look back and see all these things that he made, that he was able to do, he's listening to the, the lies that he's not good enough. So in part of that, not good enough, we can fill up, I'm sorry, back up. Um, we're, we're trying to fill that hole, whether that be with good things like building an empire or destructive things like drugs or anything in between. We can't fill that gap with anything but God. The relationship is with our creator and that's broken. So, doom and gloom, we'll get there. We're, we'll still got some more to go. Stay with me. I promise there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, what good doesn't look like. So, one of the fun things that we like to do at work is come up with these great little catchphrases, like, what does good look like? And then, what does good not look like? So, um, sometimes to get to what good does look like, we have to first identify what good doesn't look like and work our way back from there. So here's a few words that have been going on inside of my head the last couple of weeks, months, who's counting? Insecurity, inadequacy, doubt, and fear. I had a hard time writing them down. I'm having an even harder time saying them out loud here. Struggle to admit it, um, but I know it's true. And like I said earlier, um, feeling these things, if I'm feeling them, other people are feeling them too. And this is me sharing so that hopefully we can work together. Uh, these are all very negative words. And they carry a lot of weight, especially for people who struggle with these things chronically. Um, all of us feel you know, highs and lows, right? High state of mind, low state of mind. When you get stuck in this, this little bit of a funk, right? It, it's because you start seeing the doubt and the inadequacy. And then you start to believe it. 
you start to feel it and it just this recirculating pattern that breeds more inadequacy and more doubt. Think about a, a baseball player, right? I mean, he's, he's a good athlete. He's going and doing the thing. He's good at what he does. Make a mistake. Now, this mistake doesn't define him. He's an athlete, right? He, he does the things. But if he starts tuning into that negative frequency and thinking, man, I messed up. Then he makes another one. Oh no. Am I losing my edge? Am I forgetting how to be a baseball player? And then you get in this funk and they can't get out of it. That, that's, that's an athletic application, but we all have the same thing. When we start listening to those lies, we forget God's truth and forget the truth that we, we don't have to be defined by that, that we're, we're given the strength and the power that we need to go through life. The, the anxiety and the insecurity that becomes that vicious cycle, they, they do start to come out. I know that, or the things that I've noticed, is that when I'm dealing with these, when I'm in that low state of mind, I typically don't have a lot of grace or patience for my family, for the people around me. You know, I walk into the bathroom and there's the empty toilet paper roll. Ugh. Ugh. Or walk into the kitchen and there's the box of cereal still sitting on the counter. Now, these are examples of other people's failures. I've got my own. Like, I'll, I'll be cooking supper, right, and have the, the hamburger helper bag, and I'll tear the top off of it and lay it there, and then I'll throw the bag away, but the top still lays there for three days. So, but, you know, all of these things we, we struggle with. It's the little annoyances that will escalate us into not being a very nice person to not being a shining example of what delighting in God looks like. So why is that? Why? It goes back to the state of mind thing that I mentioned before. Um, talked about John Gordon. Um, he, he does talk about the high state of mind, low state of mind in the podcast and um, how we get sucked into that self-perpetuating cycle. We just can't get out of it. But it's all a lie. Right out of the pit of hell. We, we know that. We know that our brain works like an antenna. Do you know that all the, the science studies and stuff is on our head, it's like scientists have never been able to find a thought actually happening in our minds. Our minds are you know, chemical, electronic matter that does some weird stuff, but it's like the operating system is our thought, and our brains, our minds are the hardware. It's a little bit deeper than that, but trying to get with an analogy, our minds are an antenna. Our, our, the voices that are out there that are coming into us. Would anybody choose to have a negative thought? No, I wouldn't. It hurts. What do we say about hurt and pain? That's the alarm system saying, hey, we need healing and restoration. We want to live in the high state of mind, the positive thoughts. So if that's what we want, then where do those negative thoughts come from? They're not from us. They're from out there somewhere. And it's good and evil. The, I'm going to break that down just a little bit more. Um, the, the way that we overthink that the cluttered upness that characterizes the low state of mind high state of mind is clarity power knowing what we need to do knowing that i have the ability to do the thing and then executing just doing the doing the thing and being awesome at it right whatever our job is whether it be rebuilding furnaces or coming up with new great ideas on how to make us suck less in performance, but whatever. 
you start hearing these negative voices and, and get sucked back into that low state of mind. How do we get out of it? Here, here's the good part. You ready? I know, it's been heavy. The resolution. Aren't you glad there's a resolution? Jesus is the answer. All right. Joke, joke. Okay. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, that's what I think too when I hear that. Because Jesus is the answer. Okay, great. What do I do with that? We have to break it down and apply that and understand what Jesus is the answer really means. So I thought about when I was putting my notes together, writing this in a, a legit resolution, like a, a board would pass a resolution, like, whereas there is a problem or concern facing us, but be it resolved that we do the things necessary for our success. <laughs> thought that might have been a little too theatrical even for me. But um, so we still have... How do we fight against the low state of mind and the gap in this connectedness? So uh, I know I, I poked fun at the Christianese, Jesus is the answer, but that's because I wanted to make a point that we can't just leave it there. Jesus is the answer because he's already done the hard work for us. Right? The rest of it is just up to us to stay connected. When I talked about the first Adam in the first garden, Jesus is the second Adam in the second garden, and he was tempted in the same way that the first Adam was. He was given the thoughts of inadequacy, of fear, of doubt. You don't really want to go through the pain of death, do you? You're God. Just say no. You don't have to do any of that. But what did Jesus do different? When that negative frequency started coming into his head, Jesus listened to the truth of God's word, saying, I have given you everything you need for life and godliness. He has given us the abundance not the scarcity. Jesus listened to God's word. Jesus took every thought captive and made it obedient to God. And we have to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Every time we start getting that negative frequency pumped into our head. When I see the toilet paper roll or the cereal box, now I have a responsibility to take that thought captive, to die to myself and my selfish pride, and use that as an opportunity to serve my family. I change the toilet paper roll, I put the cereal box back. I only get partial credit for that because I'm not completely there yet. I still have to make an announcement that I've done everybody else's job for them. <laughs> so we'll get there, get partial credit. So Jesus was the perfect lamb that atoned for the sin of the entire world. He was obedient to death, which led to resurrection life and the, resurre <laughs> the restoration of mankind with our creator. We have to be obedient to Christ by doing those things. For me, it's the little irritation things. I'm, I'm not dealing with massive, massive problems. It's a toilet paper roll. Right? For some of you, it might be something different. When the negative thoughts of insecurity and doubt and fear start to creep in, 
we have to take every thought captive and remember that we've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a strong mind. Some translations say self-discipline. That self-discipline is important because this is the part where we start doing the things, right? Closing thoughts. Yeah. All of these things that we're talking about are connected. We can't have the high state of mind delighting in God as we live the life that he's given us and not be connected to him. We need the oneness with God. We need to fill that God-shaped hole, not with things, not with activities, not with work or friends or parties. Physical things cannot fill a spiritual void. So here are some practical ways to put these principles into practice. I know that's heavy on the alliteration. I did that on purpose. That is more in line with my theatricism. Is that a right, even a word? Do not be conformed by the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. This is on the same lines as taking every thought captive. But it makes us pay attention to those things. It makes us ask, how do we renew our minds? Spiritual discipline. Crap. I have to do something. <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to have a habit. I call them holy habits. Spiritual discipline, holy habits. It sounds way better. I heard that once. It wasn't me that came up with it. I don't think I've ever had an actual creative thought of my own ever. Um, but when I do hear something, I stick with it. Um, what are they? Gratitude. Gratitude, reading God's word, and serving others. These are three very easy ideas that we can grow. We can put into practice slowly, a little bit at a time, dunk your, dunk your toe in the water, sort of thing, and it, it'll grow. Gratitude. You think about something you're thankful for, right? It, it takes this upside down world when you're in the middle of the chaos and you're just so overwhelmed by that negative frequency. What's true? What are you thankful for? Right? Gratitude. Reading God's word. We have to know him. We have to hear from him every day. It's hard. It is hard to stop doing all the things that I want to do, to take five minutes, 15 minutes, an hour out of your day, and put into reading and prayer. But if we want to have a relationship, we want to delight in God, we want to do the delight things in our entire life, we have to do the work. We have to put in the, the discipline, the habits. Like I said, Jesus already did the hard work for us. We just have to stay connected. So, serving others. That's where I'm trying to focus. The cereal box, the toilet paper roll, picking the towel up off the floor, whatever it be, the things that would typically irritate me Approach it in a little bit of a playful way. Oh, there's another towel on the floor. There's another cereal box. It's service, right? Like I said, I'm, I'm not real great at it yet, but it's not tearing me up the way it used to. Just this morning, walked in the bathroom, and there's another empty toilet paper roll. I wasn't incredibly happy about changing it, but it didn't tear me up. I wasn't upset about it. The delight did not go away from me because of that toilet paper roll. What is it with any one of us? So, make these things habits. 
find a way to incorporate them into your life. You want to delight in God, you have to do a little bit of work. You have to take some organization. Find something that you can cut out, not be in a hurry. A couple weeks ago, Rita mentioned there's a, um, um, a, a the Right Now Media, there's a video series on there. It's like four or five 20 minute videos, which is great because you can put that on and listen to it on the way to work. Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Guys, go watch it. It's big, it's huge. It just lets you slow down. Stop at the stoplight. Don't be anxious about getting to work on time. Stop fully at the stop sign. Pick the longest cash register line and just stand in it. Again, a little bit playful, right? Not, not in a self-tormenting type kind of way, but just so that we get used to being in this pattern of open to interruption, of not being hurried. In that series, they talk about how Jesus was open to interruption. He was busy. He had his life full, right? But not so full that he couldn't stop and help somebody that needed help, that he was open to these interruptions. All right, I think that's all I've got.